What? Camera one. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad you made it. You made it out from lunch and are here to get some wisdom and get some, maybe even some questions answered from Randy today. I'd also like to welcome those of you that are online. Um, we're happy that we have a community that is literally worldwide. And so for those of you that are online, you are able to uh, write in the comments uh, your questions. Um, we are hoping to have a window of time for more questions today. So uh, go ahead and write your questions there and I will receive them and hopefully we can get to as many as we can. Um, it has been a blessing only week two of our sermon series and what a powerful message today. For those of you who have experienced at least some aspect of a covenant or covenantal relationship or family um, dynamic or situation, what a blessing. Um, but maybe there are also areas of your life where you maybe haven't or that you are hoping for that. So um, thank you, Randy, for your wisdom and for the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding in this sermon series. So let's continue the discussion, but before we get started, let's have prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we have to come together and continue the conversation and the anticipation to learn and have more hope and health and healing for our families and our relationships. Heavenly Father, I pray for each one that is here present today um, in our presence and virtually in our presence. Lord, you know the circumstances and the situations of their lives and where healing is needed. And, and we know, Lord, that that is your will uh, for healing and, and for this covenantal um, family relationship uh, to, to take place in their lives. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would intercede in the areas where people need um, hope, that, Lord, you would, you would give them hope and that you would give them uh, peace in the process because there, there may well be a process uh, to some of the healing that is needed. Uh, so, Lord, please use this time uh, so that families may be touched and healed and uh, continue, Lord, to speak through Randy and our other uh, supporters of this program program, um, that we may be closer to you and understand even more fully your love and your plan. We love you and pray in your name. Amen. 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 All right, Randy. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to Jamie. I am, I'm delighted by our church's increased focus on marriage and family relationships and other kinds of Interper, intrapersonal and interpersonal realities. And Jamie is doing a lot to lead us in that. And I really appreciate that. So as we talked about this series, one of the things we wanted to make sure we had was the opportunity to interact around some of the themes that we would be discussing. And so that's how this concept of Sabbath afternoon covenant conversations came to be. So let me give you just a little bit of background personally uh, from Anita and me in terms of interest in marriage and family therapy themes. We both come from families that were pastors' families, missionary families, church families, in church leadership in some capacity or other, pastorally and then in church administration, in teaching, in theology departments and so forth. So our, both of our family backgrounds are immersed in the world of church. We both come from very loving families, families that our parents uh, were married throughout their lives until in, in our cases, both of our cases, our fathers went to their rest. And yet they were also families that were very human and that had challenges and places where we needed to grow and, and blind spots just like we do and probably just like some of your families do, not you specifically, but you know, your parents or something. Um, and so Anita and I did not do premarital counseling. 
And so very shortly after marriage, we did premarital counseling after marriage. <laughs> we got into the therapy relationship that was truly transformational. It was powerfully important. The therapist and I together tried to work on it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't even say that with a straight face. <laughs> No, it was a powerful experience. It was painful. It was enlightening. It was on occasions joyful. And I would say for me, and I think Anita would probably say the same for herself, it was, it was a transformational kind of experience. Coming out of that, I thought, I need to learn more about this. And so that's when I went into a marriage and family therapy degree and kind of pursued on to state licensure as a family therapist. And it was in that process that I developed a real interest, not just in marriage and family therapy, and not just in church and scripture, but in how the two might intersect or come together. Because as you may be aware, some of the helping professions, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, have a very high percentage of people who have nothing to do with church, and in some cases are rather adamantly opposed to church. And I would have to say that that's not without reason at times. Uh, some of the people they see have come out of experiences that are very damaging religiously, and so it's not hard to understand why they would say, don't go back there. But in the process, many people helped form my life. And early on, Jack and Judith Balswick, I've never met them in person, though they taught at Fuller Theological Seminary, through their model, the model we've been looking at as we've been working on this series, uh, was really, it really had an impact on me. And then others along the way, Dennis Guernsey, the late Dennis Guernsey, who also taught at Fuller, interestingly. I did not ever know Dennis Guernsey or have him as a professor. A very good friend of mine had him as a therapist and shared with me about him. His little book, The Family Covenant, it meant a great deal to me along the way. And then the list just kept growing. Some of the books I shared last week, and there are many others as well, in terms of what impacted me and what helped me begin to think through, not only personally in terms of my own life and Anita's and my marriage and our parenting, but also professionally in terms of how can these themes intersect in a church context and in a church setting. So I had the privilege over the years of teaching some of these realities in, in the classroom setting and then just continuing to grow and, and continue to this day to try to add uh, to my thinking about that. And so as we were thinking about this year and planning uh, the sermon calendar for this year, it just I just thought, you know what? What if we just kind of go back to the classroom and, and teach some of this stuff? Um, and so that's what we're trying to do, not just me, but this has been a team effort, and I really appreciate that. So, if I had to say to a couple, there's one passage you ought to learn for your marriage. I mean, there, there would be so many. There are, are many powerful passages, and some we'll look at further on in the series. But there's one passage that would be truly transformational for you to learn, live, and apply in your marriage. It would be one out of Ephesians. We'll go back to Ephesians later in the series. But it would be this one. And the reason it would be this one is, I've told couples this over the years. In fact, I just told another couple this because I had only one opportunity to sit down with this couple who was planning to get married. And I said, well, there's one opportunity I have and that's all I get to talk with you about, I would want to talk with you about conflict. Communication and conflict and the management of conflict. Because if you can manage conflict well, if you can manage conflict in a healthy way, you can get through a whole lot of other stuff. But if you can't manage conflict well, there's a whole lot of stuff you can't get through that is solvable, but you can't quite get through it. So because of that, this would be the passage. It comes... At the end of chapter 4 of Ephesians, it's, man, it's just two verses long. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. 
if we learned and lived that, it would transform our homes. Get rid of the anger, the bitterness, the rage, the slander, along with every form of malice. So that's the negative side. We're moving that stuff out. How then do we live life? You know, what do we do in its place? Be kind, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Now just think about what that might mean in your family. Maybe it's in your parenting. Maybe it's in a sibling relationship. Maybe it's in a marriage relationship. But those simple words are truly transformation. Now, we said, this is scary because we're hoping for a lot of questions and I know I have very few answers so we're trying to match up my few answers with the questions um, no in all honesty we we wanted to we had a lecture last week with Dr. Barbara Hernandez I don't know if you were here but Barbara is just exceptional she'll present again Jamie will be presenting others will be presenting but this afternoon we're hoping to do mainly kind of a Q&A and I would be happiest if we could interact in those ways because I don't have all the answers. I have some thoughts and suggestions and some things that I've learned along the way that I'd love to share, but I'd also like to interact with you. So, Jamie, is there any question yet? Yes, one of our first questions comes from someone who is attending here today. And she says, is church membership ship?" <laughs> a covenant, or a contractual relationship? Wow. We'll have that person come up and answer that. Wow, that's a good question. I would say, as I hope it has been clear so far in our conversations, that belonging to the family of God is a covenantal relationship. Um. I think in the best sense of the word, uh, belonging to a community of faith would be also a covenantal relationship. But I can imagine, we humans tend to mess things up along the way, I can imagine how things could get skewed and could end up in a very contractual kind of space, even though that would not be the ideal. You think about Paul and what he wrote to different churches along the way. We just had the privilege of being in Corinth a few, what, two or three weeks ago. And to that church in Corinth, Paul wrote some of the most elevated language. It was to that church in Corinth that he wrote, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm just a resounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And, and so on goes 1 Corinthians 13. Elevated language, the love that God has for us, the love He calls us to have for each other. But to that same church, He took them out behind the woodshed and He administered some theological truth <laughs> that wasn't easy to hear. Some might look at that and say, that's contractual, but it's not. As I tried to communicate this morning, covenants have boundaries. There, we, we ought to do away with any idea that anything goes. That's not true. That will destroy a covenant. Covenants have and require boundaries. It's what we tie that to. So in, in church settings, sometimes that gets tied to the wrong things, which I think could be, could be contractually quite destructive. But ideally, if we're living what we read in Scripture, it would be covenantal. Any any thoughts about that? Yeah, I was going to say, does that answer your question, anonymous person? <laughs> Over there. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Let's... So this next question, um, this person is asking a question about her son, adult relationship with her son. Um, that uh, th and this question was from somebody in person last week. And she says that he only talks to her uh, when he wants something. Uh, so how uh, any, um, I, I guess that's not there's not necessarily a question there. I mean, there is, but she, she, that's how she put it. So I think she's asking, what does she, what do you do? What, how can you perhaps be loving 
and um, not get stuck in that cycle. And actually, it sounds like there's not much of a relationship, and she mentions it's toxic. Any thoughts? You know, this is going to sound real snide, and I don't mean it that way totally, but um, in a sense, you want to say, well, welcome to parenting, you know, <laughs> because there is some of that that's very real in parenting. But to speak to it at a more deep level, I guess one of the questions I would have is, what is he trying to say by his silence? You know, what is this silence communicating? Because uh, one of the, the communication theorists, Paul Václavic, says that, is in, that it is impossible to not communicate. That we are always communicating. Even when we're silent, even when we're, uh, the people around us say, don't ever say anything, won't ever talk to me. But Slavic would say, that is communicating. Is communicating something. So I guess part of my question would be, what is he saying with his silence? What is the communication? He may not even be fully aware of what it is that he's saying, but I'll guarantee you, if you could get him to open up, he would know what he's thinking. You know, he would know what he's feeling. He would know what's going on up here. So there might be a number of possibilities. Uh, this uh, model by the Balswicks underlines empowerment. So how do we empower our children as they grow up? What is tempting to do is to give our kids a great deal of latitude and freedom in their younger years. And then as they get toward the teenage years, toward the period of time when Christian parents get increasingly frightened of the effect the world is going to have on them, then we kind of start closing down on them, trying to restrict them. And it's understandable because of some of the fears and not being paranoid to say there are some really bad things out there. There are some things that can really mess your kids up, some of them for life. I just spoke with somebody after one of our services today who has an adult child now who had something happen earlier on, and it has altered in a profoundly negative way the entire trajectory of this person's life. So, so there are reasons for fear. So parents can tend to try to start to shut down. The problem is, as they're trying to do that, it's the very time in the developmental life cycle when the natural movement is toward greater freedom. And so these end up in conflict with each other. I wonder if, if we can empower and give them greater choices along the way in such a way that we maintain an open line of communication that talks with them as they're branching out more and more. Because a lot of times what kids, and when I say kids here, I mean it could be teenagers or whatever, their silence is saying, I don't want to talk to you about this because I'm going to get lectured or I know how you feel about it and you're going to come at me again with it or we disagree or whatever and I, I don't want to hear it. So they just don't talk about it. And it's a very hard thing and I say this as a father. I understand this well because I've messed up more times than I wish I had along these lines. But if we can show our kids that we will listen, we will engage, and we will respect their ability to choose, even when it's different from what we might choose, we're much more likely that ha to have kids that continue to open up to us as they progress through life. I don't know any of us who wants to be lectured at. Do you enjoy somebody lecturing at you? It struck me several years ago, my wife and I have been married now for 35 years, and in all those years, there has never been a single occasion when she said to me, oh baby, would you just preach to me? <laughs> she has never said that to me. <laughs> um, we, we don't like that sense of somebody's lecturing, preaching to us. So, so a young person growing up, if they have that fear that that's going to happen, why would they open the doorway to that? They don't want to hear that. So that's a possibility. I mean, I don't know nearly enough about this situation to, to 
comment too much beyond that. That's a possibility. I guess my first question is, what is the silence saying? Now, one other thing I might mention is, we live in a world where these things become black holes that suck us in and from which you almost cannot rescue people. You just disappear into this. Uh, Philip, our co- Jamie's my colleague, Philip was sharing with us a couple, several months ago a study, he, he was reading some things, a study he had read that was showing that the people who were feeling abandoned by somebody else in the family constantly on this and alone and wanting connection was not parents, but children whose parents are lost in that. So it's not a one-way street. So sometimes somebody who's silent here is not talking, is not doing anything, is consumed in a digital world and has ceased to be able to communicate and talk. Um, you know, the world of these, these hundred, what is it, 147 characters and sound bites and quick hits and likes and all the rest, in a sense, is stunting our ability to talk, to engage in conversation. And one of the ways it does that is we don't read anymore. Uh, the studies, I've seen several of them where they're looking at what people do, and this is all ages, this is not just young adults, online, like, for example, with a news story. And when they click on a news story, how long are they on that? It's seconds, which means all they can read is the first paragraph or two, and then they're on to the next one. So there isn't long, deep reading. And what I wonder is, does that lead to an inability to have long, deep conversations? You know, what, what, what is that doing to us? So that might be another question I would have. Is he kind of lost in that world and doesn't have energy or time or interest to be in contact with the world around him. So I don't know much more. Jamie, I don't know if you would have thoughts that you would add to that. I don't think I do. You have all of them. You have all the answers. <laughs> oh, mercy. <laughs> I, I do wonder if, uh, while you listened, if you had any questions. Um, if so, please let us know. We want to um, engage. We, we want, especially those who we can hear your voice, we would like you to engage. Um, and we do have some people who are making comments online. And... Um, we have another question. Good. Are you ready? Okay. This one is from YouTube online, and it says, if you have related to your young adult children in a contractual way, um, what would be some suggestions to repair that? And I might even insert in there at any age, right, at mm-hmm. different age, age stages. So if there's still children in your home, there's a couple different stages there. Then there's young adult and then adult. Right. So if we're relating to anyone contractually, it seems to me that part of what is driving that is the question, what am I getting out of this? What's coming to me? What's my benefit from this? So that if Anita and I have a, we're renting an apartment or whatever. And so we've we've signed a contract and we're renting the apartment to Patrick Johnson back there. Uh, We may love Patrick and enjoy him and all the rest, But really our interest is, are we getting the rent so we can pay off the mortgage so we can have something for our retirement, right? What are we getting out of this? That becomes a key part of it because contract in the legal sense is quid pro quo. You do something for me, I do something for you. Something for something. So it's very easy to become focused on what am I getting out of this? What benefit is coming to me contractually? That being the case, If our kids have that sense throughout their growing up years, and that that has been kind of the ethos that's been created in the family relationship, people get tired of that, right? That that it's always about you and what you want and what you want me to do and how you want me to act. And and so it's very easy to, to push that away. So how does that change and what do you do if that has been the ethos of the relationship. I think the first thing I would say is it's not going to be quick. It's not going to be a quick fix and a band-aid because something that has happened over years of time is not going, not only not going to change rapidly, but people aren't going to trust the rapid change. 
I don't trust the rapid change. Let's say I have a, a couple in counseling and they come in, they're in deep crisis and we spend, we spend the hour together and, and there are some things that come out that are helpful and they come back the next week and say, we're, we're, we've been healed, we've been cured, we're done. <laughs> hmm. Um, because the first thing that goes through my mind is, I'm really glad you had a nice week, but it's one week. You, I don't trust that that is now your future. So you don't trust quick change. So when somebody in a relationship is changing, a husband, a wife, a parent, a child, whatever it is, I think part of it is to realize you're going to need to build some history into this before there, these these young adult kids, it sounds like, are really going to trust that this is true. One of my supervisors back when I was gathering marriage and family therapy hours said to me, self-esteem is nothing more and nothing less than the happy memory of past success. Self-esteem is nothing more and nothing less than the happy memory of past success. I think there's a lot of validity to that. Well, if that's the case, that happy memory of past success is a deposit you're making in the bank, the emotional bank of your life, your family's life. Well, you can't go out and buy a house on one deposit. You're going to have to keep depositing that as it gets more robust and more healthy and more able to pay the price for what's coming. So in that sense, I would say, first of all, it takes time. I think a second reality that's very powerful is what if this parent, I don't know if it's a mother or father or a couple, but this parent or these, this couple, whoever it is, after some clear thought, clear conversation, and some deep prayer to the point where they can do it without hooks in it and without trying to manipulate, sit down with their young adult kids and say, we're sorry. There were some things along the way. Maybe we did some good things. You'll have to be the judge of that. We know we did some not so good things. But one of the key ones that we have been convicted about is we related to you in a very contractual way. You had to be and do and say and act in certain ways before you really felt our love and acceptance. We were wrong and we are sorry. And we are committed to a process of growth that will allow us to show you our love and acceptance, period. I think there's great power in a heartfelt, humble, honest confession and apology. Now, who knows how kids would react to that? They might be so stunned they just don't have words, you know, like, wow. Um, that might be that. They might say, mm, thank you. And kind of wondering, is there some, where's the hook in this here? Because there's always been a hook there before. And that's what you can show them over time. And honestly, that kind of change, by the way, if you were to do that, say, for example, with your grown kids, I almost don't believe you can do that alone. I know the Holy Spirit is going to be key in that, but I mean somebody else, a counselor, a pastor, somebody who is objective, who can help guide you through that. You're going to have to process your feelings somewhere. I, I was speaking with somebody who's kind of a coach in leadership about a situation that had happened some years ago here in our church context that was really tough for me and some things that were being said about it that were inaccurate. And this person said to me, everybody processes somewhere. Everybody. You're processing right here with me. They're just processing this. Don't be so hard on them. Everybody processes somewhere. So what I'm saying, so find a healthy and a good place to process what's going on so that you don't get into a situation where you suddenly get angry and you undo all the good you've already done by saying something that is really ill-advised. Find another place to process that so that when you're in this context, you can deal with it in a more thoughtful way 
and the feelings that you have that could damage what you're building here can be processed elsewhere. So that might be another possibility. The other thing that would concern me about this is, you know how true it is that families tend, if they're, if they're not being thoughtful, they tend to replicate themselves or live in reaction to themselves. So you have parents that are overly strict and the kids grow up and they kind of step into that mold. Or they say, I'm never doing that. And they become very, very permissive on the other end. If you just live in a reactionary or a reactive way, you will tend to swing to one of those two ends of the pendulum. If you want to live in a responsive way, you're going to need to think things through carefully and talk them through and process them to the degree where you can make thoughtful choices that are not driven by emotional reaction or emotional fear. Reaction against it or fear, and so you just step into that same mold. Um, there's a simple little rule of thumb that says feelings and experiences that I don't understand, I simply tend to repeat. If I don't understand them, don't think about them, don't unpack them, don't talk them through, I just simply tend to repeat them. There was a movie made years ago, and I'm not necessarily recommending the movie because it was, it was pretty rough emotionally at certain points and with, and with some language. I watched this back when I was in my marriage and family therapy program. It's a Robert Duvall movie. Now, I like Robert Duvall, but he only plays one role. It's just in different movies, if you know what I mean. Uh, a movie called The Great Santini. And it's a pretty powerful movie on family dynamics, unhealthy family dynamics. And so he has this older son on whom he's very hard. He's a military man. He's an Air Force pilot. And he's very hard on this son. It was kind of like the story I told this morning. He told us, and you're going into the military. Well, I don't want to. It's not a question of whether or not you, you are going in. And if later you want to change, whatever, then we'll talk about that. But you're going in. So he yanks him out of bed early in the morning on his 18th birthday. And, you know, they go sign him up and he takes him out and gets him drunk. And, you know, just the whole thing that he is. And this kid hates it. And his, his mother is a very gentle soul. And she's trying to lead him in a gentle direction. Because she sees that he's a gentle soul. On the other hand, his father says, I want to give my son the gift of fury. Get out there and gobble up life, you know, and all of this. And so I don't want to do this. If you don't want to know one thing that happened, then, you know, for the moment, just recite scripture. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it's a spoiler alert. I'll tell you that. The dad dies. They have the funeral. You know, military families move a lot. And whenever they move, the dad would have them up at three in the morning, packed in the car and headed off, you know, and, and they hated it. They all, Why can't we sleep in a little bit and go at a decent human hour and all this? So anyway, after he dies, they have to vacate the house they're in. So I think it's the last scene of the movie. The family's moving yet again, only this time without the dad. And what does the son do? He has them up at 3 a.m., into the car and headed down the road. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, the very thing he hated, did never want it to be. Couldn't understand why they did that. His dad passes off the scene and he seamlessly steps right into that role. So another concern with these kids would be if you have been treated in that way, there can be a strong emotional pull of a family transmission process in which you now step into that role. I mean, think about this. There's a theory. There's no way to prove this. But after you see a few of these, you think, well, this is probably not too far afield. That says that we tend to marry a person like the parent with whom we have the most unresolved issues. There's a cheerful thought, isn't it? I can't stand the way my, I can't stand the way dad. And then you roll over in bed and there they are. It's like, oh my goodness. 
Uh, well, it's that, that that just moves you right into that. And that's what made me think of the great Santini. So with them, if they've experienced all of this, contractual thinking, behavior, rejection, acceptance that is tentative and all the way throughout their lives, there will be a pretty strong pull to do that in their kids' lives. Maybe one of the ways they can be reached is to say, did you enjoy your parenting? No. How do you envision your parenting being different? And that can be maybe a way to enter a conversation. That's a way too long answer, Jamie, but that's a thought. It's a good answer. <laughs> I definitely agree with you about um, perhaps needing some help to process if you're the parent going to your children, no matter what age they are. Um, and also, especially if you've watched the sermon and, and these discussions, um, maybe taking some time to understand so, and give examples to your children about the things that you've done. So essentially humble yourself to say, I know I've done this, might have been like a one-time event or something that has been perpetual, and, and admit that and say, I know I was wrong here, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. And so if you have a hard time being able to identify those things, then it would be a, a therapist and counselor who could help you to distill down those things. And then one other, one other <laughs> comment about um, uh, the theory of marrying someone that's most like the parent that you have unresolved issues with. And one of the reasons I think that is, is because the person is focused on, I'm not going to be like that or they're fo just generally focused on it because it's not been processed. And so whatever you're focused on, you're more likely to gravitate toward. Isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. So if you didn't get a therapist yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that's an amazing statement Jamie just made because think about this. Fear has, and, and I think some of that is driven by fear. I don't want to get in that. I, you know, Fear has the capacity I don't know what I'm doing here, but fear has the capacity to create what it fears. Fear has the capacity to create what it fears. So here you are at the three-point line. There's 10 seconds left in the game. You make these two shots. Your team's probably going to win. You miss them. We're probably going to lose. And what are you standing here saying? I can't miss it. I cannot miss these shots. What do you do? I mean, it was the NBA Finals, and it was Utah and Chicago, I think it was. This is years ago. And, and Carl Malone is at the free throw line, Utah Jazz. If he makes them, they probably beat the Bulls. An unthinkable accomplishment. And they called Malone the mailman. The reason they called the mailman was because he delivered, you know. And it's a Sunday evening in Utah, and he's at the free throw line. They call a timeout, and Scottie Pippen, uh, the, the power forward for the Bulls, walks over to Malone and says to him, mailman, don't deliver on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> and that got in his head. And he missed and they lost. Fear has the capacity to create what it fears. So when Jamie's saying, you know, you, you say, I don't want that. And so you get so focused on, on not doing that that you wake up, you just did it. <laughs> So, yeah. I just want to give a quick shout out to a few people <clears throat> that are online. Good. Um, Darren Wright in Texas is with us. Beautiful. Um, Bernice Mason from St. Joseph, Michigan. And mm. let's see. That's right up the road from Andrews. <laughs> yes, That's it is. That's a pretty part of the state. Mm -hmm. Emma Ornopia from Ohio. Miami, Ohio. Son and daughter in law are back in Ohio now. So. Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, so it's lovely for some of them that have mentioned where they're joining us from. Um, so the next question, Randy, is uh, kind of the opposite of what mm. you just answered. So this question is from YouTube, um, somebody who added something on YouTube, and it says, I'm on my own now, but I would like to be able to relate to my parents differently. I know they love me, but it feels more like they relate to me in what you have labeled as contractual. I would like to try to relate to them in the way you recommended or would recommend. Wow, that's a really good question. Now, I'm getting onto thin ice here because I'm going to talk a little bit about parenting. And I've learned over the years, 
you can say bad things about a person's house and about their car and about their all kinds of things. But man, when you start questioning their parenting, you better run for cover. So this will betray some of some of my and Anita's predispositions. But the goal in when you have young children, children that are growing up, the goal or the emphasis to be their friend is not helpful. They need a parent, a couple of parents. They need guidance. They need support. They need boundaries. They need direction. And in the process of doing that, if your whole goal is to be their friend, you're not going to be able to do some of that stuff because when you say no, you cannot go to that party. They're going to be furious at you. Everybody's going. Now, truth is, half the rest of the class is at home having that same argument with their parents. Not all of them, and that's what's scary. Because we discovered, wow, that there were vastly different boundaries among parents in a classroom at a Christian school. Vastly different. So as they're growing up, you cannot just be their friend. Now, that's not saying you can't be friendly. And you can't build a friendship and good relationships with them. That's not saying that. It's just saying you're not here, you're here. As somebody used to say, age has not made you equal. You've been down this road a lot longer. And so you have some wisdom they don't have. They think they have all the wisdom that you know nothing. I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> That's what a lot of them think. And, uh, and yet, that's not accurate. What you can do is have a goal of becoming friends as they become adults. And I'm telling you, some, Anita was just talking to me after lunch today. She was just talking about having our daughter and son all over last night for dinner. She said, I loved it. We just had conversation and laughed and joy and now, at this age, they're adults, they're married. Friendship is precious. And it is not only possible, it's healthy. Because we're not in the role anymore of saying, you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't do this and don't do this, or we will have problems. Now we're in the role of friends. But you get to that role as they grow up and as you increasingly release them to the world. So that becomes the goal. Now, in this case, it sounds like, like it's in the reverse. So how do I, as an adult child, by the way, I just have to tell you, as, as our son has gone into pastoral ministry, it has been a tremendous joy to me to have a lot of conversations about pastoral work and preaching and all these things with him kind of as, you know, just colleagues in, in ministry. And I think I mentioned this somewhere, maybe last week. Um, so I was talking about the, the preaching calendar for this year here at our church and things we're going to emphasize. And it's when I was thinking about doing this series and I said, you know, I think I'm going to do something just kind of with teaching, with the blackboard. and with the, What do you think about that? And I asked him and I asked our daughter that a lot because I've learned they know a lot of things I have no idea are real. They hear it. They've got, you know, their ears to the ground. I said, so what do you think, Austin? He said, Dad, here's what I think. When you've been in a church a while, you can try all kinds of things you'd never try in your first year. <laughs> so he said, I think it's great. Try it and see if it works, you know. Um, so that kind of friendship and that collegiality and that ability to talk is, is really precious and really meaningful. I wonder... Jamie, I'd like to hear this from you, thoughts on this from you too, but I wonder, as an adult, going to your parents and treating them as friends, and even just saying that, Mom, Dad, I'm, I'm an adult now. I love you. I'd like to just talk adult to adult, friend to friend. You don't need to tell me anymore what to do. In fact, if you do, honestly, it'll make me angry. I don't need you telling me what to do. And I think you probably don't even want to have to do that yourself either. But I like to be friends. 
How could we be friends? What, what, what would make that possible? I, I don't know. Some families are, are very not used to talking that way, and that's a very threatened thing to say. But just to engage the conversation about being friends. You have to remember this. This was something our, our therapist many years ago, 34, 35 years ago, um, told us, but I've never forgotten it. Um, he said in terms of maintaining a healthy relationship where you're equals, where you're partners, where you manage conflict well, he said, you got to just treat each other as though this was a platonic friend at your work. Because if you do this kind of thing, that kind of thing, and the other kind of thing, platonic friend at work, you can kiss that friendship goodbye. They're not going to put up with that. But your spouse kind of has to because they're your spouse. In that context, you know that, and it's easier to do it. So just say, this is my friend. I'm going to treat her. I'm going to treat him just like I would treat a friend. So I wonder if that would work that way as well, from, from parent to child or from child to parent. What, what are your thoughts about that? Daniel, for some reason, we keep, it feels like I keep cutting in and out, but may I don't know if I do or not. But yes, Jane? I think that it's important to remember <clears throat> that there are three kinds of relationships, child, um, parent, and adult and so until the child becomes an adult, it's a parent-child relationship. Then when the child is an adult, it's an adult-adult relationship. Mm -hmm. You'll always be their parent, and there will be lovely parts about that. You'll still, I'm sure, I'm not a parent yet, but you'll, you'll still have worries and, and concerns and hopes for your child. But there does need to be a, sometimes a restraint on how much you even say um, or how much of your opinion that you give, because uh, otherwise that will begin to feel more like your the parent is parenting the adult child, you know, at this, at this point, adult child. What's a little bit confusing is sometimes uh, then that that switches and get into other topics of of how sometimes the parent acts like the child, <laughs> and then the um, then the child who might be adult or not is parentified, and right. it's a little right. messy. But but to answer this question, um, I think that it's important to get to a place where both people can say, "Hey, we're both adults here." And and then there's that extra bonus after that to say, "And you're my." my father or my mother. And that's a blessing that's, that's beautiful. beautiful. That is beautiful. So I'd be curious, some of you here today have adult kids. Uh, what would you treasure or what do you treasure the most from your adult kids? In that adult to adult relationship now, what do you have and love or what do you crave and hope for? What would that be? I'll tell you, for me, and Anita may agree or differ with this, but it's just time. Time and conversation. What about others of you? I'll repeat them here on the mic. What do you yearn for? What do you crave? Or what do you experience that blesses you? Yes. Time. Conversation. Learning from them. Yeah. That kind of switches, it flips the script, doesn't it? Because they've been learning from you, and suddenly now you're learning from them. Okay, very good. Someone else? What do you enjoy, appreciate, or crave? Like them, inclusiveness. Them including you in what they're doing in their lives? Man, I can relate to that, and so can that woman, beautiful woman right over there. It's very true. Someone else? Yes. Billy? Mm. Mm. So one of the really meaningful things was that time of home teaching, homeschooling, and now they're making choices along those ways as well. That's beautiful. Very good. Very good. Yes, Ernie? Uh, Ernie, since this is going out, why don't you speak into this? 
since um, <clears throat> just piggybacking on what some of the individuals have mentioned here, what has been meaningful to myself and to my wife uh, at our 25th year anniversary, marriage anniversary, both of our boys gave a, uh, well, really the oldest one gave a tribute to both of us. But he mentioned something that I shall never forget. He said, we can choose our friends, but we cannot choose our parents. And that is true. I hadn't really thought about that one. <laughs> but he said, if we would have been able to choose our parents, we would have chosen them. And he pointed to us. That is very meaningful. That is beautiful. Thank you, Ernie, for sharing that. And I think in, in addition to that, um, just like you have to, if you're married or coupled, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, hope, hopefully in a contractual relationship, you make that decision, right? So, so this is where these three different types of relationship titles, child, parent, mm -hmm. and adult, you get to choose. You do get to choose if you want to be friendly, you want to be friends. Um, and that takes work. And I completely agree with you. Sometimes I get couples in my office and I'm just like, wow, can't they, can't they at least have like, you know, you don't treat your coworkers like right, this. Right. You don't talk to them like that. You don't have that, that, uh, tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Susan, Sue Schaller said she treasures friendship and the time that her kids choose to spend with her. Beautiful. So friendship it, it, getting back friendship right now is a theme. Absolutely. Okay, I'll do that then. I, I, I structured myself for the love of my child and my family. But in the years, I got to the habit of parenting. And the habit of breaking that type of parenting required my daughter's cooperation and patience. And as she brought the attention up to me that uh, I'm an adult, you know, <laughs> I know I can do these things. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got to a point where I, I had to say, give, please have patience with me while I adjust to my new role as a parent. And she understood there that it wasn't a moment of confrontation, it's just breaking habits where the habit of parenting has to be broken. And it may take for some parents a little bit more time than others. But that actually increased our intimacy. That's really wonderful. I love how you said that. Be patient with me as I'm relearning my role or this new role of how parenting works now. And that's really true. There comes a point in time when our kids don't want to hear it. They've heard it all. They don't need another lecture. They don't. In fact, one of the endearing statements Bill Loveless made, how many of you knew Bill or were here at church? And, okay, so quite a few of you. He made many memorable statements, but one of the ones that I remember that made a lot of sense to me. He was in a series talking apparently about marriage or family or something like that. I don't remember all those details. But what I do remember is he was talking specifically about the issue of your child falling in love with and planning to marry somebody outside of your faith tradition. So in our case, it was Seventh-day Adventist. It could be different depending on one's faith tradition. But so his question was, what do you do if your child is going to marry someone who is not a committed follower of Jesus, not a Seventh-day Adventist, which is what you are? What do you do? Should you say anything? And we were young adults at the time and probably had many friends who had been in that. And I can remember some friends whose families were in meltdown mode over this issue. And it created all kinds of conflict and anger and cutoffs and everything else. So I was very interested to hear what Bill would say about that. What do you say if your child is doing this? And you may even see, as parents often can, this is trouble their temperaments or whatever it is, in addition to their different faith, this is trouble. So what do you do? And here's what Bill said. Do you have a right to say anything? Absolutely. You're the parent. You have a right to say something one time. And then shut up. 
And you remember Bill. Bill could th say things pretty directly. One time, and that's it. So sit down and say, we're concerned, and here's why. And then do the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. Shut up. Because what often happens is we keep grinding on it and grinding on it and grinding on it. And there, you know, I, I don't want to hear this anymore. And you know what that tends to do? It tends to drive them further and faster in that direction. So I think the best advice I ever heard uh, was from a minister. And he said, as my children have grown older, I say less and I pray more. I love that, Anita. I say less and I pray more. That's beautiful. All right, we've got just a few moments, Jamie. We have some other programming going on here, so we're going to need in pretty close to five. But any other thought, comment, question? I don't think so. I mean, I have, yes, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that um, knowing that your children are in God's hands is pivotal. And it brings peace to your life. My mom, you had a conversation with my mom before she passed. And that's, uh, that was one of the biggest things that just brought her general peace was knowing that uh, she can't save her children um, and that God will and that her prayers will be answered um, uh, at one day in heaven. You know, so your your children and you know, arguably my siblings are anywhere along along the path. They all they all believe in God and and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, as parents, there's there's details that you worry about. Right. Um, but but they're in God's hands. Very true. So let me wrap it up by saying this: What might be something important to bear in mind as we seek to live as spouses? as parents, as children, as siblings, uh, what might be an important thing is we seek to move if we're in a contractually based family toward a covenantally based family, what might be important? So years ago, I ran across a statement that I think came out of a 12-step group at some point along the way. But it really hit me in a very at an important time and in a meaningful way and i have prayed this many times over the years about family but even far beyond family and it's simply this empower me to take the actions of love to improve my relationships with others empower me to take the actions of love to improve my relationships with others I value very much studying and learning and growing about family and marriage and parenting and all the rest. And I have benefited, Anita and I have benefited personally from counseling relationships, had the wonderful privilege of being in the counseling setting as a counselor with many others along the way. I value those things. But I will tell you, I've experienced this and I've seen this. There are certain times in a family's life and certain experiences for which there can be no better answer, no more effective answer than repentance. And that means kneeling down and repenting before God. I have been wrong. I have done wrong. I repent. Please empower me to change. And then what are the next steps? Empower me to take the actions of love to improve my relations with others, with my husband, with my wife, with my parent, with my child, so that what I feel at the moment becomes secondary. I'm not saying feelings are unimportant. I'm just saying that becomes secondary to taking the actions of love. When you take the actions of love, over time, as Scripture says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap if you don't give up. Take the actions of love to improve your relations with others. And when you do that in your homes, over time, it can have a transformational effect. So let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you so much for your grace and your love. Thank you for the privilege of having these kinds of conversations. We pray that you would empower us 
to take the actions of love to improve our relations with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Blessings.